it's a privilege to be here today. I'm going to talk about something um, called neighborhood meetings. And this was born out of an idea from actually Jennifer Hall, who is one of the people that I supported on the leadership team. And what she wanted to do was to have each of our neighborhoods come together, uh, residents coming together with team members and family members, and talk about the issues in the neighborhood, closest to the ground, to be able to talk about any of the issues that were going on in the neighborhood, and have an actual agenda, have it once a month, and just really very real issues and being addressed, minitize it, and then bring all that information back to the residence council. So residence council, great forum. We want to make sure the residence council is not a lame duck forum. We want to make sure it's a really interesting and exciting forum for residents to, to speak about things. So, so what we want to do is to make sure we get the real story from residents and the team members living in the neighborhood and working together. And you know, somebody uh, said earlier, people don't always get along. Team members and residents don't always get along. In your family, does everybody get along? I come from a family of nine, that's huge. You know, boys against the girls, you know, my sisters are always saying I got everything, it's not true. You know, um, <laughs> I grew up on a farm, so the boys had to go out to work. The girls are always in the house helping out, real division of labor. But anyhow, everybody had to get, get along, mom and dad made, so, made sure. So there was a common vision that when you stepped outside the door, you're a Vermeer and family. So you have to make sure that in your neighborhood that you're all, you know, you can have conflict, you can you know, maybe not get along. But once you um, have that face again uh, for the rest of the village, you're a united neighborhood. So you have your agenda, you have your minutes. And one of the things, uh, uh, part of the agenda would be to review quality initiatives. So we would have something called top five, bottom five. So we collect a lot of data in long-term care. We talk, we talk about satisfaction surveys, we talk about wound care statistics, we talk about all different kinds of things. And so the neighborhood chooses uh, the top five things to, to talk about, and they, they also choose to uh, talk about top, the bottom five. So we want to make sure that there is like good analysis of, like fishbone analysis of the things that are happening that are really great, and how can we make it even better? And maybe some of the things we're not doing so great, and maybe we can learn from some other neighborhoods, and we can post that information onto our websites, and then maybe other people can give us some insight as well. So as a neighborhood, you're going through all this stuff. Um, and then the ambassador, so it's an elected position within the neighborhood. The minutes are presented by the neighborhood ambassador to the residence council. The real advantage of doing this sort of thing is that uh, team members are hearing from the horse's mouth. That's the resident, the residents are not horses, but you know, really hearing right there, talking, residents talking about an issue. And so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, a little event that came out of one of our neighborhood meetings. So I was actually sitting in on a neighborhood meeting. There, it was February, and they're like, oh, it's like so blah in February and stuff like that. Let's do something fun. We're like, oh, okay. They decided to have a block party. Oh, what are we going to do? What, what's the theme? What's, you know, what are we going to do? So uh, people decided, okay, uh, Lin Linda really likes music. She's going to help create a playlist. She's going to get somebody to help with an iPod. We're going to create a playlist. Oh, you're going to work on de decorations. And, and of course, a lot of the ladies wanted to do the food thing. And I'll have to tell you that they had this block party. They created an invitation, sent it out to um, all the residents on the neighborhood, their family members, uh, team members. They all came together. It was a Sunday night. And I, one of the things that really struck me was in the food preparation. It was very odd, some of the, well, I thought it was odd, but I had to go out and get the groceries. Like the, the little onions, the little, they wanted to serve those, and strawberries, and cheese, and, and specific kinds of cheese, and the specific kind of, I'm like, fine, whatever. And one of the best things that uh, somebody said, she said, I just loved getting ready for a party. I used to do this all the time. It was so much fun. And the party was great. Uh, there, it was supposed to be just for the neighborhood, but there were some people that snuck into the party, just saying, just <laughs> crushers. And they're like, because they heard the music, they're like, this is awesome, coming. So to your point before, uh, Dave, you were talking about how do you get people to come to a party? Well, you serve, well, didn't serve booze, so you didn't have to serve booze. But we had uh, refreshments, we had great music, and a great vibe. It was just a really great energy coming from that dance floor. Now, some, one person almost did fall uh, doing a twirl, but we caught them, so it was good. <laughs> so, okay. My name is Jackie Maxwell. I am the director of nursing at uh, Westlake Terrace in um, Picton. And uh, the, what I chose to speak today is uh, d the development of an internal collaborative team uh, to respond to responsive behaviors. Uh, and this is actually an old, old um, initiative uh, that I had uh, completed in 2004. The reason I'm bringing it up today is I'm now in a new home with Omni. 
um, the home that we originally created this in, uh, I was there from 1988 until 2012. And then I joined BSO for two years, and then I went to work with Health Links for, uh, to initiate that program, and I missed long-term care terribly. <laughs> I missed the contact with the residents. I missed the residents coming into my office. I missed the frontline team members coming into my office, so I had to go back. Omni had a position, and I traveled an hour every day. Um, one way to get to that position because I truly needed to get back there. So uh, back in um, 2004, we uh, had experienced a situation where one of our residents had uh, gone to the hospital, didn't have a very good experience because of his um, mental state. When he came back, he was crying to us, thankful that he was back <coughs> with familiar faces, and he said, please don't send me back. So in that respect, we looked at the program that we had in place. I had an RN. We had an RN initiative. Um, we had her dedicated uh, <coughs> once every two weeks looking after our behaviors uh, or people who had responsive behaviors and um, following them to see what more we could do and that we were doing everything we could for them. Um, but the home also, we, had, um, we <coughs> didn't have a particular unit. We didn't segregate any residents, we, we had them all living in the same living space. So it created some challenges for us in a small home. So um, that RN and I got together and said, what, what more can we do in this home? That was the start of um, what we called our supportive measures team. <coughs> we had two core programs, uh, Respect Always and the supportive measures programs that Omni Healthcare had put in as an organization. Um, at that point, we had 14 homes um, that we were, uh, Omni uh, had structured under them. And uh, basically, they educated us on, on the programs, and we were um, enlisted with the task of going back into our homes and implementing those programs and living, uh, living those programs. So the respect uh, always and the supportive measures programs actually really um, <coughs> Uh, served as the basis of the core for um, our team. We actually uh, developed the team internally. Uh, we had um, the RN that was pieces trained. We had um, the dietary staff, environmental staff, life enrichment team members. Um, the physician and our maintenance uh, were ad hoc. Um, for external team members, we had the psychogeriatric resource consultant, our uh, psychogeriatric uh, case manager, and then uh, when the palliative pain and symptom management consultant uh, came on board, we actually um, drew them in as well. And so we created this team. Um, we basically, um, with the team, we just invited everybody in, explained why we wanted to create the team, um, asked them for their feedback on it. Um, we also looked at, um, from the resident perspective, uh, we did go out on the floor and talk to the residents about um, responsive behaviors and how we could improve uh, things with that. So we involved our residents and we involved the family members as well. And then we created this team and uh, the outcome of the whole um, situation was that we ended up having um, fewer people going out of our home. We had fewer referrals. Uh, we were initially starting and having a monthly meeting. It went down to every six weeks that um, we could um, spread out the meetings. Uh, we weren't, uh, we actually utilized our resources very well um, with the um, the staff, um, so their time was just placed in that one hour period. And then um, we, again, the outcome for the residents were that the residents were able to be cared for in their home in the manner in which they wanted to be cared for. And uh, we also had better satisfaction with, the, with our other residents when we did the satisfaction surveys. They were happier in the home environment. There were fewer um, noises going on in the home and um, uh, fewer interactions, negative interactions with their co-residents. So uh, we did have a very positive outcome with that. So my name is Tanya and I work at McCormick Home, which is a not-for-profit uh, home in London. We have 160 long-term care beds. We have a day program that is specialized in dementia care and our governing board is in the building as well as our foundation, which raises funds uh, for those that we care for. 
So in terms of sort of looking at the culture change process at McCormick Home, it's fairly new. We're sort of in the process. We've just rebranded um, and we have a new visual identity. And with that, we're also going through a strategic planning process. So we've hired a consultant to help us look at our strategic plan, what is our mission, vision, and values, and looking at what model of care do we truly want to make sure it's the right one. Um, we recently had uh, the director from the day program attended the Walk With Me conference in Edmonton, and that Our Care video, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's a model of care from the Australia that sort of puts a new perspective. So we looked at that as part of our strategic planning, and sort of um, my role as the administrator, I find, is to really sort of uh, teach and embrace the staff in the moment when something occurs that I think, okay, could we look at that differently? So some of the examples is when I first went to McCormick Home, we had a resident who admitted from our day program. He has dementia, but he was fairly high functioning and he loved to walk. He loved to go outside. So the first response from the staff was, well, he can't go out there. He liked to walk our parking lot. I said, well, why can't he? Well, he might fall. I said, yeah, and he might fall in here. So what can we do? to enable him to do what he wants to do so he can enjoy his life. So we talked about the safety aspect because with the day program we have buses coming and going. It's pretty high traffic volumes at time. So we asked him if he would wear one of those fire orange vests, you know. So he thought that was great. And um, <laughs> so we put it on the back, uh, McCormick Home. So in the handout, um, McCormick Home Foundation uh, did a video this year for their annual fundraiser that speaks to this is long-term care 2016 and in this is Charlie is his name and he talks about how proud he is of this vest and if I get lost they know where to bring me back because on the back it has McCormick on. <laughs> so he loves it he can still go out if he he's safe enough of that you know people can see him and if he falls then we'll go get him up and hopefully he doesn't but it's allowing him to have choice and his choice was to do that um, another example is we have bird feeders in our main sort of lobby and they were out all summer and winter comes and all of a sudden I hear they're taking them down. I said, what, what do you mean you're taking them down? The residents love them. Well, Charlie, same gentleman, he <coughs> fills the bird feeders and he might fall. I said, okay, because it's kind of back in behind the garden so it's not the easiest thing to get to. I said, well, did anyone ask Charlie if we, f if we fill them up for the winter, will you not go back there because we don't want you to, you know, well, no, we never asked him that. I said, well, maybe we should start with that. So, of course, he agreed to that. We filled them up, and everybody got to enjoy the birds for the winter. Infection control nurses, I love them. They all do a great job. Sometimes that medical focus takes over. So we had a crazy critter program where a gentleman in the London area comes around with snakes and lizards and all kinds of stuff I wouldn't want to touch, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so first thing... Oh, they can't, that's infection control. They might get this, they might get that. I said, oh, come on, we'll have hand sanitizer, it'll be fine. We have pictures with residents with pythons around their neck and Aww. birds on their fingers and of course not, uh, spiders, they loved it. So again, it's like, we can't always just say no, how can we do this and you know, sort of live within somewhat of the rules. In terms of flexible dining, we heard about that yesterday. Um, so again, just looking at ways we can provide um, food or fluid or snacks, whatever it might be. And also, uh, our foundation supports two big resident meals with their families throughout the year. And typically, it was capped at a number. So we couldn't have more than, you know, 60 people. I said again, well, why is that? Well, you know, we don't put them into the dining room. We set them out in the activity rooms in the dens. I said, okay, well, can we, for that one day, make exceptions so that if a resident wants their loved one to come, we'll facilitate that. If it means we have to do two dinners, we do two dinners, but I'm not saying they can't come. That's just not. This is their home, and if that's their meal, we'll make it happen. So those are sort of some of the um, grassroots sort of in-the-moment teachings that have certainly kind of helped change a perspective. Again, it's that whole promoting the social model of change. Building relationships is key. 
Family councils, well, yes, some of our family members can be challenging, we know that, but I encourage my staff to step back and say, if we put our parents in long-term care, we would be the worst family members around <laughs> because we live it, we work it, we know what should happen or not. So they are advocating for their loved one. They're not trying to be difficult. Put yourself in their shoes. And, you know, it's a partnership. And now our family council, their whole perspective has switched because they now have an active, uh, we do new admission tees every quarter. So all the new admissions that have come in the last quarter, the family council comes, the management team comes, and it's a partnership and they're flourishing, the relationship has changed and we're moving forward together. Um, and I think, you know, yesterday, I'll just be one more thing and I'll move. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're so afraid of risk, I think as a sector and Again, uh, the Residence Bill of Rights to me is sort of the Bible. And so the rest of the act and the legislation, yes, we have to follow it, but where does one part of the act supersede the Resident Bill of Rights? And as operators and managers, we have to advocate for the residents because we are their voice as well. So minimizing risk, yes, sure. But I think the other part is we have to make sure that We've done our due diligence that we've let them know these are the risks, but if they're gonna do it, they're gonna do it. And so I alluded yesterday a little bit to that negotiated risk form. Um, that's a tool we use that we can show we've talked about the risks, they've agreed to do that, and we support them in that. And uh, finally, just the handout wherever that is um, from Kate. Um, the McCormick Home Foundation is really helping build videos really to reduce the stigma that living does not occur in long-term care. So the Golden Dreams program is a program that supports the dreams of residents. One of them went to a ball game, somebody went to the beach, somebody went back to their hometown. They're very simple, but it grants them the opportunity to do something they've been longing for. The video with the long-term care emphasis on 2016 is really about what we do each and every day and the impact that our staff have in their lives is evident. So I would encourage you to look at those videos, the links are on the handout, wherever that is. Um, but it really is uh, helping break the barriers down and the stigma and sort of shows that, you know what? Long-term care isn't what media says it is. That people live there, they love it, they adapt. And yes, nobody sits around the table at Christmas saying, I can't wait till I go to long-term care. We know that doesn't happen. But when people get there, they love it and they flourish. I want to tell you about a lesson I learned from Ruby. Ruby was 94 years old, and the village of Glendale Cro uh, Crossing had just opened. Uh, that was six years ago. And uh, I remember the, uh, the team members came up to me. They said, oh my gosh, Ruby has alcohol in her room. And <laughs> Ruby has her Ativan in her bedside drawer. And she's got a scatter rug. She's got a rug. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? So, okay, I'm the GM. I, I gotta solve this problem because I'm the GM with all powerful. So I, I went up to Ruby, uh, up to Ruby's room, knocked on the door very politely. I said, Ruby, um, there's a couple issues that the team has come to me and I wanna talk to you about that. She's, and she had all the patience of the world, 94, she's been through a lot. And she says, okay, sure, come on in, have a seat and uh, very kind, very lovely. And um, I said, Ruby, there's a couple things I'm really concerned about your safety. And uh, I said, you have this, this rug here. She goes, uh-huh. When I get out of bed, I want to have my feet touching something other than that cold tile floor you have. I said, and I said, she said, What's, what are you worried about? I said, well, I'm worried that you're going to fall. She goes, have I fallen yet? <laughs> I said, not yet, Ruby, but I think you might. She goes, if I fall, I'll get rid of the rug. But until I fall, and I'll, I'm willing to take that risk, I want that rug there. I said, okay, thinking, okay, that was the easy one, right? <laughs> and the alcohol, the alcohol. And I said, Ruby, I understand you've got some brandy. She goes, I am not an alcohol alcoholic. Four o'clock every day, I like to have a little shot of brandy. And, um, and then she said to me, are you treating me like a child? And I thought, holy crap. Oh, the sun. <laughs> holy cow. Uh, I thought, oh my gosh. I, 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 thought, I said, I am so sorry, Ruby. And then, then I knew what was going to happen with the out of it, right? So, so I said, 
I said, I am so sorry about that, uh, Ruby. I understand. And, and if at a time then you feel like you can't manage that anymore, then you just let us know and we'll help you with that. Because you know, sometimes you've seen some of those med rooms and they look like liquor cabinets, right? So, and then the, about the drugs, and I said, I am a little bit concerned if somebody comes into your room and would take those medications. And she says, there's nobody wandering around here. And we, all, we actually have a process that the director of care can come in and, and do the um, safe management of medications for, for somebody. So I had the director of care assess her. She was very, very capable to administer her own medications. And, but it really taught me a lesson. When she looked in my eyes, she said, are you treating me like a child? And I thought, God, I am such a schmuck. <laughs> and so Ruby, 94 years old, taught me a very big lesson. She taught me to listen to feedback from others and from all stakeholders. So I talk about here the conversation cafes. Every year we have just input from our stakeholders in a little more formalized way. We, we, we've done that for, with Schlegel Villages for many years. And that has really evolved through the years. But it's really a one-to-one, -one, mano a mano, saying, tell me what's important to you. What's working really well? What's not working so well? And how can we change this together? As opposed to, here's all my stuff that I'm just going to throw at you. I'm going to vomit all over you. And then you're going to have to fix that. Thank you very much. So all, always working together, which is great. Uh, being transparent and communicating well. And transparent means everything, warts and all. Like you're talking about, uh, you know, I talk about our neighborhood meetings, being really transparent about this is the state of what our um, infection control program is right now. It's maybe not so great. So how can you, how can everybody on this neighborhood help to make those numbers better? How can we make this process better for the health of all, for example? And then following up on concerns and issues. Because you know yourself, um, those team members who are closest to the residents are able to fix that issue with the residents a lot faster. Hot food, hot. I can't control that necessarily, right? So. Cold food, cold, I can't control that either. But those team members who are preparing the food, who are holding those food, having the food in that survey and making sure it's getting out to the resident on time, they can control that. That's much easier. And then uh, making sure that there's always a loop to always continually improve and uh, making sure we're listening. We have one mouth and we have two ears, and I should stop now. Um, my three recommendations that, I've, um, that I discovered uh, through many processes, not just necessarily that uh, team building process, but surrounding yourself with champions who, who share the same passion for the change idea that, that you're trying to initiate in the home. And uh, it's, it's one thing to have one person passionate about an idea, but it takes more than one person, we all know that, to actually affect that change in an organization. So um, make sure you find those people in your organization. Uh, the second thing is use any opportunity to have a group discussion. Ensure everyone in the group has an opportunity to express their thoughts. There's lots of times that uh, we've had team meetings and there's a person sitting right in the back who you see that's itching to say something or they're very quiet the whole team meeting and if uh, normally um, I ignored that at um, early on in, in my career but uh, as I developed as a leader I basically started going and doing the round table before I left that meeting and I'd say do you have anything to add do you have anything to add and it it gave that person um, the opportunity to come forward and saying, yeah, I want to I want to share this. And sometimes they were epic ideas that that they would have to share and that we could help uh, to implement whatever the change was. And the third thing is to utilize the check ins during the change change process. I usually built uh, check ins um, during team meetings. Uh, usually you put in a change, you have a meeting, you put in a change, they oh, we're going to have another uh, meeting in uh, three weeks. But I didn't wait for three weeks to check in with my team. I would show up on the night shift, I would show up on the day shift, I would go into the dining room depending on where the change was. I would show up and I would say to the team, how are things going? I would specifically ask around that change idea, what, how are things going with that? And it gave them an opportunity that because uh, oftentimes you see the same people coming to the meetings, but you miss some of the other key players in, in our team that can give the feedback. And then I also would go around to the residents and I would say, how's it going? and they would be able to give that feedback. And then we could also, um, in doing that check-in process, um, uh, just in 
small huddles, you could actually uh, identify pressing issues that if you left them, they would probably blow up in your face, whereas you could address those pressing issues immediately and then um, the frustrations would be decreased. So I sort of alluded to the, um, the ministry challenge that we face and certainly I think, well, According to the uh, manager of the London South o Office, um, there are changes coming to the ministry and apparently there's going to be some big webinar coming up right shortly. Um, but I think as a sector, we really need to start standing up and, and you know, challenging them back. I think the other thing is, is obviously transparency is key. And um, at McCormick Home, our director of communications on our website, we have a response to every one of whatever is a written notification. VPC because we know that the public reports don't explain anything and there's nothing good said it's all the bad things so I think we have to own that a little bit um, the association actually called to sort of get a bit more information about how we're managing that uh, but why are we hiding behind something that in most cases it's probably one incident and there's no prevalence but that's not what the public sees so I think you know until we get that sort of buy-in and participation from the ministry uh, culture change um, doesn't align with the legislation we have to adhere to. So if we don't stand up as a collective voice, uh, I think we'll hit roadblock after roadblock, but that doesn't mean we give up. Um, I think as uh, every organization needs to truly uh, look at the different models of care and determine what model of care is it that best suits your home. Maybe it's more than one combined because every home area might have a different feel, a different mix of people. So we're really looking at that as an organization right now to make sure that we pick the right one. Uh, we have a um, desire to advance in dementia care as an organization. So we're looking at models of care that will um, assist with that as well. And I think the other thing, um, we know that through the behavioral supports uh, program, and, um, the social model is sort of the focus, the interventions that get put into place. Yet when the funding increases come, the majority of it hits nursing. And so again, there's the shift that needs to happen in terms of uh, the funding model, that it shouldn't always just be nursing. Yes, nursing care is important, but through Behavior Supports Ontario, the majority of the interventions are social. So they know that, and yet the funding isn't matching that philosophy. And lastly, environmental factors. Certainly older homes, I, I previously worked in a, a C home and as I said yesterday, we had residents that had to elevate down to another floor for dining and that's not a good quality of life. But that doesn't mean they're not receiving good quality care. And I think, um, you know, it's a real challenge until everybody redevelops, if they redevelop all of that sort of thing. But even little changes that you can make that don't make cost necessarily a lot of money, but freshening up pick a room, pick a lounge. We just implemented, we had a kind of a dead space off our one elevator. So we now have our um, honor guard quilt after somebody passes away. It's on full display, you know, we have palliative on the wall, care, comfort, peace. Why are we hiding behind the fact that death occurs? We know it happens, it's a part of the life journey. And now that space has made a huge transformation and it was really some paint and some letters we stuck on the wall, but the impact is, has been ginormous. Also, we just kind of implemented a, our worship center, um, was really just being used for spiritual programs and a bit of a dumping station for equipment, which was really a bugaboo for me. So that has now been converted into a multi-purpose room. The priority will remain for spiritual services, but why can't it be a multifunction living room where a family can come and sit? We put a little kid's corner back in the back with little tables and chairs and a chalkboard on the wall and little toys to promote uh, intergenerational programs and also maximize the use of space to make it more uh, home-like and promote living. So again, not a lot of money, took some time for planning, but the impact again, we ha now have residents going in there with their families and we've had, we just implemented literally, um, and some kids have already colored on the chalk, so we're like, woohoo! <laughs> um, but anyhow, it's, it's those sort of things that uh, I think um, as a sector, we need to just sort of keep all of those in mind and, and then how do we move forward uh, in the future will remain to be seen.
We are watching online also for questions coming in, and I'm actually I'm going to maybe challenge this group with, with the question. It's from Kensington Health, and their first question, which I can answer, is were any inspectors from the Ministry of Health invited to the Culture Change Exchange, or are there any present today? <laughs> And the answer is the invitation that when we, when we posted it online, the invitation was wide open. So anybody was welcome to attend. Um, I think Kate, looking at the registration list, I don't think there was anybody from the Ministry of Health that had registered. Um, we could have probably brought in another chair and squeezed them in had they wanted to attend, but no, no, they're not here. But the question I'm gonna pose to the three of you is, how do you include Ministry of Health inspectors in the discussions that you have about these culture changes that you're doing in your homes? Tough question from Kensington Health, but there maybe we've got some words of wisdom or experience you'd like to share. So that is a really difficult question because uh, we're always talking about uh, ourselves being at cross purposes with the Ministry of Health. Those regulations were uh, developed for some really important reasons. Things happened in long-term care that if there were no regulations, things would go kind of willy-nilly. So we kind of sometimes demonize the Ministry of Health and all their inspectors, and we think that they're just terrible people. They're normal people, I think, and uh, they go home at night to their families, and they're trying to do the very best for residents who are living in long-term care and the families that are helping to support them. And you remember that slide that Wendy had before with the family members, like their, their stress levels up there? They're the ones who are saying, or giving the feedback to the Ministry of Health. We need to do a better job of getting that stress level down for people and to really, really be intentional about communicating with family members about uh, what the kind of care that we are providing. But as far as having them uh, be partners in the culture change, we can keep on educating we just keep on talking, keep on pushing. I remember earlier on there we talked about um, in the Pioneer Network there was you know the greenhouse model where there's ten people like that's so cool. I always thought that was great. Uh, there's ten people living and then there's people who are, are cross functional and they're you know anyhow it's very it's a very neat idea and um, there it was in the states and there was an inspector who had a real major problem with a cookie jar that it was a communal cookie jar. Because, oh my gosh, that people would be putting their hands in a cookie jar and contaminating all the cookies in the cookie jar. So that the administrator, who had, or the leader of that organization said, I'll take that one. That's okay. Because that is part of home. Like that's, in my house, there's a cookie jar and we do not use tongs for the cookie jar at our house. But I can understand people get really worked out about, about those kinds of things because there are infectious diseases out there, all that kind of stuff. But as far as working with it, just keep on going. You have to have fortitude, you have to have passion for what you believe in, and keep on, keep on. I think the other thing that's important is don't be afraid to call the ministry. I call them all the time. If I have a question or I have a concern, I don't hesitate to call them. They're not as, I mean, yeah, they're a bit scary at times, obviously, when they come in. And, and depending on the inspector, we know that depending who it is, they give off an aura that's not always nice. Um, but I will say that in the London area, uh, myself and two other administrators had the, well, privilege, I'll call it, to go to an inspector meeting and sort of shed some light on how they're perceived when they come into our homes. And for some of them, it was a real eye-opener. Some of them, it didn't maybe change their approach, but there was uh, a difference when they came back the next time. So don't be afraid to reach out, build a partnership. It is a partnership. They're not going away whether we want them to or not. So how can we work with them collectively? And I don't hesitate to say to them, we're all on the same team here. You have a job to do, yes, but so do we. And at the end of the day, we're all trying to do the best that we can with the little that we have. So when you come in and you say this, this, and this, it doesn't leave us feeling like we've done a good job, yet we know we are. So can you just change the way that you speak, that you interact with us? And, and I would say that, well, that's kind of what I said, really, in a nutshell. Like, <laughs> You don't have to be difficult, like be <laughs> respectful. I wouldn't treat you that way. And in fact, you know, I've gone as high as their boss and said, listen, if I were one of my staff, they would be in my office so fast, their head would spin. Well, thanks for letting me know. So don't be afraid to pick up the phone because they're out representing the uh, Ontario government. And if they're not behaving the way if, that you think they should, then they're probably not and they want to know about it. 
When you speak about being afraid in the ministry, don't be afraid. They're people just like us. Um, I have the privilege, I've been asked by the ministry to go to every area office and speak to them on how to talk to residents. Instead of, instead of pinpointing questions, how, how do we react when we get to a home? I said, be yourself, be normal, and treat the residents like anybody else and have a conversation. It's not their fault they're in long-term care. It's not their fault that maybe something's happened. They're, they're just people, just like the administrators, just like any staff. I've told staff too, be yourself. That's all you can do. Isn't that great advice, be normal? <laughs> And I should say, I, it's not that we're scared of them, but sometimes their presence and their approach gives off, they're intimidating to the staff. Not so much, I mean, I, I can hold my own, but the staff are very intimidated by them because they, not all of them, they're worried because they think if they do something wrong, then we're gonna get a fining and then, you know, it goes on and on and on. Uh, but, but it's very much what you said. We're all human beings and treat each other with mutual respect. And at the end of the day, if you do that, then we're all working towards that common goal. Um, I, I do very much the same as what Tanya does. Uh, I will phone them up. And I do, <laughs> you do have to treat them like a person, um, not be so intimidated by them. And I, <laughs> one, one year in the old program, when uh, we had specific inspectors that would come into the home, we had changed hours, and the person we were getting, I had so many phone calls from other DOCs and administrators, oh my God, he, he's terrible, he's like a nightmare when he comes to the home. And after the first day there, he was debriefing, and he said, uh, so um, how are you doing? And I said, well, I'm doing great, you're not the ogre that they said you were. <laughs> and he just looked at me, and. I couldn't believe it. it was out of my mouth before I realized it. So I said, I'm sorry. He said, do they really think I'm an ogre? And I said, uh, yeah, kind of. I said, I got warned about you. And he said, oh, seriously, I was that bad? And I said, yeah. And he was, he totally changed the rest of the visit. We had an amazing experience with him. And we had, I think there was only one thing he found. And um, since then, it, it's been, even when I see him out in the shopping mall or whatever, he comes up and he chats with me, how are you doing? And it was just, uh, it just uh, broke that ice. So you can't be afraid to be a person with them because they are people too. We've got a few specific questions. Thank you for tackling that question, an online question. Um, I was just going to add to that, that um, when we heard the physicians speak yesterday, I recognized that we make some assumptions, that they know things that they don't. And I think we make that assumption of inspectors as well. And one of you said we need to take the opportunity to educate them on the initiatives and some of the reasons that we're doing things. And we make an assumption that they know what we're doing. And then we just get upset and go, oh, you know, give up on that project because it doesn't meet the regs. But if we take some time to explain it, walk them through, often they'll come around and they'll go, okay, I just needed for, my, for their files, for their notes, for their report, to be able to say they did their job and that residents aren't at risk. And because as you said, they're there for, for a reason. So I think we make assumptions that we shouldn't. So I feel like we're going to kill this till it's dead, this subject. But what I was going to say is in my 10 years of coming out of acute care and then into this 10 years ago, this is a new conversation. So you talk about paradigm shifts and culture change. We didn't talk about our reports like that up until now. I have to say this is like one of the most honest conversations I've heard about it. We were all saying, I'm such a failure if I don't. Like I think it's important to do well on them. But I have to say, like I applaud this group for having this conversation actually and not letting that define actually who we are and become this stumbling block for us, but sort of moving together, as when you guys were talking about it, sort of moving together and advocating for the fact that we need to follow rules and stuff, and there's good reasons they're there, but not to let it define us and beat us down. And I think, actually this is the first time I've heard this conversation, really. So I think it's a good way for us to look at 
and them coming in and all the craziness that happens those two weeks. Some of it is funny because you do laugh after. Like, it's just ridiculous. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but not letting it, like, just berate all of this great stuff because this is way more important. And my colleague, too, said, like, resident rights far outweigh any of this stuff. Like, it's... So who cuts if you get a, a finding on one thing? Like who, it, it doesn't define the care we're doing. So it's kind of refreshing to me to hear us move away from this being like a punitive thing. Let's just get rid of that in our sector and I think we'll go a lot further. So I just want to sort of just build on that a little bit with um, the ministry that just came to our local flag group, which is administrators DOCs. She actually said, well, it's just a written notification. I said, well, to you, it's just a written notification, but to us, we feel like we failed. And to the public, it's going to look like X, Y, Z. And, uh, but it's, it was almost like they downplayed the fact that, well, it's, you know, it's just a, okay, but it's not, it doesn't feel like just that to us, right? Um, so that's why we've sort of taken the approach that we sort of respond on our website so that if somebody is looking at our home, it's all there. You can read it, and as we know, most times the, the, the issue that's been identified, you fix it before they even leave the building. But nowhere does it say they did a great job because they're not allowed to say that anymore. And so, <laughs> you know, but their perspective is, well, it's just this, and it's your job to make sure that your families and your residents know that it's just that. But that's not what the public perceives. So, you know, it, it's still, even though to them, you know, we had in our first RQI at McCormick Home, we had a written notification for infection control because out of 160 rooms, there was one bedpan on the floor, one. Well, where's the prevalence in that, right? Next year we had an RQI. What's the first thing they see? A bedpan on the floor. Did it even get in the report? No. <laughs> so it's still objective and subjective to whoever it is that walks in. And, you know, so we've just taken to the, we now respond on our website, here's it is, we had it fixed before it went, or this is what we're doing to fix it, because who knows how long it'll be there before they clear it. 